This man is turning Indonesia upside down. Today, a new Indonesia is being built, Joko Widodo tells his supporters. Today is a new era. But nearly half of Indonesian voters don't think he has what it takes to lead the world's third largest democracy. They want a strong leader. That's the promise of Prabowo Subianto. Why does Indonesia need a strong leader? I don't think Indonesia needs, everybody needs strong leaders, no? You, you want a weak leader? <laughs> you need a decisive leader. Yes, of course. Leaders must make decisions, right? Even a manager of a football club must be decisive, no? On July 9th, more than 130 million Indonesians voted in nearly half a million polling stations across 14,000 islands. Historic elections that will select the leader of the world's fifth largest economy. Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Ressa. Indonesia is the linchpin of Southeast Asia. It's a member of the G20 and, along with the Philippines, one of the founders of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Where Indonesia goes, we go. But beyond the economics, you have to experience the sheer drama of these elections and the choice in front of Indonesians between a break with its political elite and a jump into the unknown with an orang kecil, a symbol of every man, and a strong leader, someone who can bridge the past with the future. Many of the Indonesians voting in this polling station grew up with their leader, 62-year-old Prabowo Subianto. His father, a renowned economist, was a minister in the cabinets of Indonesia's founding father, Sukarno, and Suharto, its longest-serving leader. His brother was estimated by Fortune to have a net worth of $700 million in 2003. At the height of Suharto's power, Prabowo was a rising star in the Indonesian military. He married Suharto's daughter and was, at one point, considered a successor to his father-in-law. That all ended in May 1998, when an economic crisis combined with massive protests to end Suharto's 32 years in power. Reformasi and Indonesian democracy had arrived. There's a lot of uncertainty. There was always this argument that Indonesia is not ready for democracy, that Indonesia would still need some kind of benevolent dictatorship. Yeah. But my argument from that time, I, and I've never changed my, my point of view, is that it's not the people who are not ready for democracy. It's the political elites who are not ready for democracy because they would have to give up their privileged position, their control of the political system, their control of the economic benefits mm -hmm. that uh, having power uh, allowed them to have. You know, this collusion between power and business. Prabowo was thrown out of the military, disgraced for human rights violations. He left Indonesia, became a businessman. By 2009, he had a net worth of at least $165 million. Prabowo in 97, 97 98, uh, basically uh, went through a, a huge turmoil. He's a reformed man. Uh, he would not be uh, uh, contesting three general elections, spending tremendous amount of resources, times, and uh, commitments uh, to Indonesia's democracy if he doesn't believe uh, in a new Indonesia. Prabowo grew up believing he was destined to lead Indonesia. So when Indonesia had its first ever direct presidential elections in 2004, he ran and lost. In 2008, he created his own political party but failed to qualify for president, so he ran for vice president. He lost again. Now, it seems, his time has come. Sandy Uno is part of the new generation of Indonesia's wealthiest, an advocate of young entrepreneurship. He believes Prabowo will make Indonesian democracy stronger. 
he's completely reform man and he believe in it uh, that that uh, democracy is is uh, a foundations of Indonesia and I think this is where uh, you know his message uh, is, is getting across yes. people uh, believe in him that democracy must be pretty much equipped with a strong government because if democracy is not uh, equipped with a strong government you will have chaos Hari ini kita membuka lembaran the winner in these elections will succeed Indonesia's first directly elected president, former General Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono. President Yudhoyono won a second term in 2009, but the last five years have largely been disappointing. That helped set the stage for Prabowo's rise. The perception is that Yudhoyono has been frozen, uh, has been inert, and, and has lost opportunity after opportunity. Uh, people are saying, whatever we want, we don't want that. The backdrop of the second Yudhoyono term, I think, has made it possible for Prabowo to have this great leap forward that he's had. I mean, he's come forward as the can-do, tough, to Gus, the firm leader. And I don't know that it would have been so easy if it wasn't for the second Yudhoyono term. There's a real problem in Indonesia's democracy. In the late 90s, Dewi Fortuna Anwar was a vocal Suharto critic pushing for political reforms. When Suharto resigned, she became the spokeswoman for his successor, President B.J. Habibi, and has been in government since. Now she helps chart Indonesia's strategic plans. When I see how Indonesian politics have been exercised, you know, this real checks and balances between the executive and parliament, I was very happy in the beginning to see that the executive is now really constrained because we have a much stronger legislative body. Yes. But then the legislative body is so fragmented and, and it's so f full of conflicting interests that it is not really possible to exercise power effectively to serve the people. Mm. Now, so, uh, you know, there's also a lot of frustration. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, 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 in government. Part of Prabowo's appeal that he can push through these political roadblocks. It's a remarkable thing that, that uh, elicits a degree of admiration even for those who are quite concerned about his rise. Uh, he's just worked very, very doggedly. The Prabowo team is the better team, but they also don't respect the rules. They'll do whatever it takes to win. Stand on the right, a clever reference to the ballot and to the moral high ground of 53-year-old Joko Widodo or Jokowi. For the first time ever, an outsider, someone not part of the political elite, is poised to win. He is what Indonesians call an orang kecil, a little person, just like them. Well, Jokowi uh, is you're very much your ordinary man. He's the everyman, the guy you'd meet in the street, maybe the guy who's driving the taxi you're in. Jokowi grew up in a Java slum, became a furniture maker and exporter. He became the mayor of Solo and, in 2012, the governor of Jakarta. His quick rise to power is sending shivers through Indonesia's power structures. We need to restore trust. And how do we restore trust? We need someone trustworthy, trusty, to be on the top. Why? Because it's, it's uh, that individuals or symbolize the hope that we can change. Indonesia, in a clear break from politics as usual, Jokowi shunned alliances of convenience like with Golkar, Suharto's former ruling party. Although it had an established political machinery he could have used, he and his team saw it as too much of a compromise. Sources tell Rappler large corporations came with offers of cash for his campaign, money Jokowi returned because he didn't want to be saddled with vested interests. If he loses, Moves like this may be to blame. In terms of his earnestness and his sincerity uh, and his non-political professional style, Jokowi is a little bit like Barack Obama. Doesn't have the soaring uh, rhetoric and eloquence uh, and doesn't have the charisma. But he has that same, you know, dogged, earnest uh, goodness about him, uh, which is a positive thing, but it's also uh, in politics, in real politics, uh, carries carry some liabilities. 
Is this Indonesia's Obama moment? This is Indonesia's Jokowi's moment. And, and I think uh, we have seen someone who was not predicted that one day could serve as president be in that position. This is not only about solving problems, creating good policies. You are serving as a symbol of the nations. Your record must show the records of the nations. Mm -hmm. And it, it must reflect the pride of the nations. We need someone that is out there and make everyone feel that's the guy. Anis Baswedan is a university president known for harnessing grassroots support for education. He set aside his own political ambitions to help find the right leader. He says Jokowi, as president, will change the way Indonesians dream. It translates into inspirations to more than 60 million families across the country. Parents can say to their children, don't worry about politics. Look, you, if you study hard, if you work hard, you can be like him. It is about the future. Volunteers drove the Jokowi campaign, which often made it disorganized. Jokowi's own walkabout style that worked so well for him as a local official now seemed like a liability. During the month-long campaign, Jokowi's more than 20 percentage point lead was whittled down to nothing. Analysts said Jokowi ran a lackluster campaign that often showed him as a weak and indecisive leader. His track record shows he can be a COO, an operations lead, but does he have what it takes to be the CEO, the man on top? For Prabowo, I asked him whether he was a member of the political elite, and he said, I'm an outsider. I fight the elite. Can he really change? There's another wild card in the July 9th elections, social media. Ai Makaraig tells us more about technology and how it's changing the game of politics. It's not Flappy Bird, it's Go Jokowi. In the country with the world's number one Twitter city, this is the new campaign stage. The heated race for Indonesia's presidency plays out online in games, music videos, and hashtags. Want to know the platform of Jakarta Governor Joko Jokowi Widodo and former Special Forces General Prabowo Subianto? There's an app for that. Flap Jokowi Man shows him dodging offers of cash, while Prabowo's Hour 6 Actions depicts the former general's policies and programs. Both camps know they need to engage young netizens, with one-third of Indonesia's 190 million voters aged 17 to 30. But the negative campaigning offline becomes even more viral online. Social media saya kira punya pengaruh terutama pada pemilih muda dan pemilih pemula. Nah, sejauh ini kami juga menggunakan sosial media untuk melakukan sosialisasi, tapi sayang sekali memang di sosial media kita ini masih banyak sekali uh, kampanye hitam ya, terutama melalui akun-akun palsu, akun-akun yang tidak jelas anonim. Ini yang saya kira uh, merusak juga uh, sosial media menjadi satu uh, perangkat atau satu media yang sulit bisa dipercaya gitu karena orang bisa seenaknya main fitnah, kasar dan seterusnya. Social media also reflects realities on the ground. Prabowo has a slick top-down online army while Jokowi has a less organized campaign. Uh, our teams are is also working mm -hmm. on this. Mm -hmm. And in terms of size, I, I think we we have dominated in terms of size. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of message, our message uh, often not that focused. This is perhaps the first uh, elections where social media played an important role. Uh, but Indonesian youth are taking the lead. Youth movement Ayo Vote or Let's Vote reaches out to young voters by gathering them to view election debates World Cup style. TV networks are turning off many young Indonesians with biased coverage of the candidates their owners are supporting. But the success of events like Ayo Votes Viewing Party shows the youth are passionate about their country's future. 
I'm not really optimistic first, but now I I I I, I see that the young people in Indonesia want to um, participate more about politics, want to learn more about politics, want to put their heart about politics, want to put their concerns about politics. Uh, really, really, uh, because we 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 really hope that there is a hope in the future. Indonesia's youth are using social media not just to promote their candidates, but also to ensure their votes will be counted on election day. On the eve of Indonesia's so-called social media elections, the youth turn to the internet and their mobile phones to help them decide who their next leader will be. Despite partisan traditional media, young voters in the world's most active Twitter city engage in the polls by channeling their creativity and hope online. The choice polarized Indonesian society. Analysts estimated up to 15% of nearly 190 million registered voters were undecided, leading to July 9th. An hour and a half after the polls closed, former Indonesian President Megawati Sukarnaputri and PDIP party leader declares Jokowi the winner. <laughs> An hour after that, Prabowo also declares victory. Uh, because, I mean, nowhere in the world, yeah, that we, we're aware of, the people make, you know, victory claims uh, an hour and 25 minutes after the polling booths. I mean, it, the vote counting, the, the, vote, the, the, the vote counting hasn't even finished yet. President Yudhoyono asked both sides to stay calm and wait for official results on July 22. Credible polls predict a Jokowi win 53% to 47%, but Prabowo claims 16 other counts have him ahead. Regardless of who wins, the problems remain the same. Machet Bangit, the traffic is bad. It's a phrase you hear a lot in Jakarta. Just two days ago, we were stuck for more than six hours in start and stop traffic like the one you see behind me. It's something you think about that is personally inconvenient, but the traffic has become so bad that it's now an issue of national concern. Part of the problem right now is that traffic in Jakarta alone is estimated to cost 0.6% of Indonesia's GDP. One of the reasons it's so bad is not just because of the infrastructure, the roads and highways, but also because gas is so cheap. A liter of fuel costs about 24 pesos, half what it costs in the Philippines, or about 50 U.S. cents, far cheaper than what it is in the United States. The Indonesian government subsidizes fuel. About 27 percent of the 2014 budget goes to fuel subsidies. That is more than its entire, all of its capital expenditure, including what it spends on infrastructure. This is one of the biggest challenges for Indonesia's next leader. Transportation and logistics are the big challenge uh, for Indonesia. We all, all the studies show that our lack of competitiveness is because of the infrastructure bottlenecks and the logistics bottlenecks. Traffic. Yeah, <laughs> traffic and just getting, you know, getting people, uh, getting goods uh, yes. to move efficiently and effectively. Is, and, and telecommunications even, yeah. So th these are the big challenges so for, for the incoming government. The man leading in the presidential quick count, Joko Widodo, says he plans to cut subsidies, but they're political costs, so he plans to do it in phases. Uh, part of the uh, large portions of the subsidy goes to electric uh, generating uh, activities. So Indonesian's power plant is also using subsidize uh, fuel yes. and that is an issue yes and the idea is to convert that okay into coal base yeah. or gas uh, gas uh, natural gas yeah. base instead of using fuel and that will ease up the subsidy we still need to retain a subsidy to the low income family a decade ago indonesia's first president chosen by the people promised to deal with fuel subsidies and corruption. It is our biggest weakness. Because of corruption, we are hemorrhaging economically. In order to fight injustice, poverty, and mismanagement, we need to eradicate corruption. 
A decade later, there's been progress, but those problems still remain. Along with an evolution of the security threat Yudoyono first dealt with as security minister, then as president. Terrorism. A decade later, the world is more complex. Mari Pangestu was an outspoken Suharto critic. She joined the Yudoyono cabinets, first as trade and industry minister, and now as tourism minister. So I think in the first cabinet, uh, you, you could say that we part of the easy components of reforms we were able to do. Yeah. We changed laws and we even introduced the beginnings of bureaucratic reform and so on and so forth. Then we, when we came into the second cabinet, I, uh, we found that we, we, we were uh, in a situation where it's the harder part of reforms. When you talk about uh, a lot of the institutional issues, every election, every time we have uh, process, it has, there's always a learning and there's always some uh, institutional development. So we are progressing uh, towards uh, a better uh, governance, better democracy, better uh, economic situation. I don't think uh, people should forget that. And we don't want to go back to something like pre-98. Yeah? Uh, so how do we prevent that from happening? Recognizing that the reforms ahead are going to be more difficult than the last 10, 15 years. <laughs> Indonesia has the world's largest Muslim population. In 1998, it began to prove democracy and Islam can go hand in hand. Within the wider uh, community, uh, particularly now within, within the Islamic uh, world, uh, we have seen so many unfortunate failures of democratic exper uh, experiments. Uh, it is very, very important that Indonesia continues to show you know, this sh uh, shining lighthouse uh, that shows that you know, there, are, there is an, a different way yes. of, uh, of state and society relations of how Islam can be placed within this uh, democratic context in which uh, different, different faith and uh, you know, uh, a different way of life can, can be respected. Indonesia uh, has to succeed. Uh, to give hope uh, to, to other uh, communities that have this aspiration you know, to open up as well. And to the wider global community, uh, I think Indonesia is also uh, maybe the one that can prove that the stereotype about Islam and violence you know, <laughs> is not, it's, it's not the only narrative uh, in, in, the, in the Islamic world. A new leader for the world's third largest democracy as Indonesia opens a new chapter with new hopes and new dreams. Maria Ressa, Rappler, Jakarta.